This show is exhausting like a fat man running a triathlon through the Sahara. Before we begin, please subscribe to help build my kingdom so you don't miss a new video. So this next episode begins with Velma summarizing that she never quite fit in with the other kids, and that despite getting Freddy arrested, her reputation still hasn't improved. She's pushed over as easily as most protesters when someone runs into the two-week celebration of no murders with news of... Another murder. This exonerates Freddy, of course, and at a meeting, Velma butts in about why people didn't care this much about her mom's disappearance. Why does this show keep doing this? You already came to the realization your mother left because you were a little demon. If anything, this should spark curiosity in Velma, because now she can ask Freddy to help her look around the mansion grounds to see if there are any clues to Dia's disappearance. Also, another person is dead, you wet piece of toast. The immediate problem is a little more important. So if Dia's disappearance is linked, which we all know it is, then the safety of your fellow students should be number one priority. This show is so backwards, Bizarro wouldn't know how to make heads or tails of it. Anyway, so the sheriff quiets everyone down and he explains the connection between the victims is that they're all hot. Then, because Velma doesn't know what standards are, she decides to get pissed off because white men are the ones who declared these girls to be hot, and and then the mayor and sheriff, in turn, challenge Velma to find the five hottest. Leaving the meeting hall, Daphne thanks Velma for making this list, they repeatedly have moments, and Olive interrupts about how the women will do anything to get on that list. The next day, we get this montage of all these teenage girls trying to sexualize themselves in order to make this list, and if it wasn't for one of them wearing shoes, I'd be awfully suspicious of multiple people, including Dan Schneider's HBO account right now. After one of the girls opens up her field goal, and takes out the entire marching band, Velma goes to the band room in front of everyone and tries to finish off her list. Of course, she has a mental block because she can only think of Daphne, then Norville walks in on her fingering her pen, and this joke ends because Velma gives this speech about hating beauty standards. This is exactly the problem with this list. Men make everything about them and what they want. Our whole lives, girls are told by guys there's a right way to be hot. Guys even teach us to be ashamed of our own bodies. And ironically, making this list validates those standards before talking about how she's so attracted to Fred. But also find Fred attractive. He has this deep, inexplicable magnetism. Guys, see, right there, okay, all of this hatred for white men, and then she immediately flips it into her fetishing of them? Like, come on. Anyway, Norville suggests that Velma go and meet Freddy so he can make this list for her. At Spooner's, Freddy and Velma meet and he makes the list in no time flat because all real women have a good pair of reasons to be saved. Then she gives him the feminine mystique and oh my god, they're going to sympathize him right in front of us, aren't they? Over at Daphne's house, she is crossing off a list of private detectives who won't help her, and the last one is actually kind of clever in that absurd way this show hasn't committed to. Even a broken clock is right twice a day, I suppose. Anyway, she tries to leave, but her door is locked, and her moms won't let her out, but they let Norville in. Norville is here to get information from Daphne about her personalities, when out of nowhere a rock is thrown through her window. No one is there, and it turns out the rock is a geode from the local crystal mines. At the mayor's office, Velma drops off the list, and after Velma Velma's snarky comment, the mayor gets the idea that in order to help protect the girls, Velma should make them ugly like her. The girls then arrive at Velma's house, and they get ready to go through the same treatment as most video game characters in remakes. Meanwhile, Daphne sneaks out of her house and leaves with Norville for the Crystal Mines. Then, as this game of ping pong continues, we bounce over to Freddy in the park, who has finished reading the book and notices a hot woman tanning. But now he's more interested in an empty potato sack painting a dog. And to Freddy's horror, he realizes he has now been brainwashed. Now the story paddles us over to Velma's house again, and the ugly lessons begin, but not before a comment about... So we have one day to unlearn a lifetime of internalized misogyny. Please. Please, just stop making up phrases that make no sense. After the montage, we're still not done getting smacked around like Joel, and we catch up with Daphne and Norville at the Historical Society, and we get an exposition dump about the town's history with a greedy prospector, and then crystals were popular, until cocaine. Also, the art style changed here for 
each of these different eras, and it blows my mind that no one decided the 70s style updated for today would have been far better to use, considering it's closest to the original Scooby-Doo. Oh well, I'm sure one day in the far-flung future, we may finally find someone that doesn't hate the fans as much as Mindy. Maybe in another lifetime. Anyway, Daphne recognizes the minds from when she was a baby, and thinks maybe her birth parents are trying to contact her before racing off to the mines again. Back over at the mayor's hall, Velma is ready to reveal her efforts, and they've been reversed. Velma is not happy, and the show actually gives an almost correct self-aware point to Velma's limiting view of women. You think every girl deep down is like you, but you're wrong. In fact, your definition of womanhood is even more restrictive than ours. The next day, Velma has thought about what Olive said and shows up to school looking like your average TikToker ready to sacrifice some goats. Just then, Amon's girlfriend goes into labor and Velma calls on the girls to help her out. You see, alone, Velma cannot draw the attention away from the miracle of birth, so she comes up with a plan to have the girls help her to draw the attention away. The girls start dancing while Velma clears the way like a snowplow parent, and Freddy sees Velma and falls for her. Over the Crystal Mines, Daphne and Norville have a chance to enter the caves, but Norville gives up on mimicking Daphne's personality, and at the cusp of finally, possibly, finding answers, Daphne just gives up and leaves with Norville. That night at the hospital, the girlfriend has given birth and Velma is thanked for helping. Then, back at home, Freddy meets up with Velma and asks her out, but she now turns him down? So he was brainwashed for nothing. Great. And then we find Gigi has changed her dress the next day and bumps into Norville, and they fall for each other. Oh my god. God, they changed Scooby into her? I, I don't know how to feel about this, but so much for man's best friend, he's probably hanging in a pita freezer right now. One of the biggest issues this show fails on is an emotional level. This is the kind of thing that turns most people off from a show when they can't listen to what is happening and stew on it for a moment. If it has nothing to do with Velma and Daphne's relationship or problems, then it doesn't matter and gets played off with a bad joke. Freddy gets exonerated and his dad's reaction is... But we just turned his room into an ice skating rink. Norville expresses his love and affection for Velma and... I like you. Like, like, like you. Wait, what? No, you don't. You're like a brother to me. That's hilarious. <laughs> or even the discovery of a new dead body. Help! I just found another dead girl killed in exactly the same way as the other. <laughs> well, great. A $10,000 banner down the drain. Why is the banner $10,000? Who'd you buy it from, the Mafia? If you won't stop making jokes almost every second and give people no time to breathe, you lessen the impact of what precedes it. If Gandalf falling into the depths of Moria was followed up by Frodo saying something stupid like, Bring me back a large fry! The next morning news would have reported Peter Jackson's body was discovered strewn across five states. Even the background gags get repetitive with joke after joke, and while some are cleverer than others, it is the saturation that doesn't work. Think of the difference as having the choice of a large pile of snack foods and one well-cooked meal. All of these snacks have so little value, you would have to eat enough of them that you would look like Mindy herself before you have an ounce of satisfaction. On the other hand, a well-cooked meal takes time planning and effort to make. Something like that, while not perfect, will still satisfy you and leave you wanting more on the first try. This feeling of satisfaction is near impossible to achieve when your main character, Velma, is herself a sociopath. She completely disregards Norville unless she needs something from him and hardly treats him any better than a free ride around town. She brushes off the importance of murdered students because the town is reacting more in the now than her mom's disappearance all these years back. And she blames others for things that she did, like when Daphne says that she's concerned about Velma's leaving her again, and she lashes back a bit before acknowledging in the same conversation maybe Daphne was right. If I can't be convinced these characters care about each other beyond superficial lust or ironically a whipping boy, then how am I supposed to care for anyone else? Like at this point, I just want the killer to win. As far as I'm concerned, the only one that seems to have their head on halfway right is Daphne, and I don't think this will last long now that only a few steps away from getting answers on her goal, she gives up and walks away. Yeah, real dedicated 
related to the cause there. Daphne will probably go the route of Don Lemonless from Rings of Power, being one of, if not the best character in the show, to just another forgetful moron that will cause more harm than good. And with Norville and Freddy basically being useless, I'm willing to bet that Gigi, now getting ready to join the main cast, is going to be the misunderstood character that was sympathetic towards Velma and rises to be one of the best and brightest in the group. And for reasons that are... Obvious. At this point, I just hope she isn't insufferable. Two episodes of padding, and this is as far as the show has gone. A disjointed mystery, mostly unlikable characters, and as much bullshit drama as high school. No wonder Velma sucks. It's written by people who never grew up, which only proves my point I've made for a while now that most writers today have no experience to call on. Oh well, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.